Good morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 366 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. <laughs> yeah, with a hair flip. Boom. <laughs> Today, recording day is Monday, April 22nd, 2024. And it looks like it's going to be a gorgeous day here at the Beaver Lodge. And you got a little bit of an extended good morning because I'm in a very good mood. There you go. Ah, I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. But before we do anything else on this wonderful Monday morning, let's ask Mr. Grizzly how his mental health is doing today. Sir. Good morning. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to clear my throat. Good morning, Mr. Beaver. Uh, mental health. I think I'm. Uh, I think I'm pretty good, actually. The, the sun is up. It's bright. It's shiny. It's. Um, it's chilly. It's minus two right now because I just took Lola out for a walk. But uh, it's it's uh, it's nice and sunny, and I'll take that, even if it's chilly. Um, sunshine always does so much to lift your spirits and make you feel better. Right. I completely concur. We had um, a lot of rain in the last couple of days, which, yeah, no complaints. Water tables really need it. Oh, and yeah. um, it looks like um, in certain places, um, some uh, late snow and uh, rain stuff they got is uh, making people breathe a little easier in terms of water tables, especially out west. But um, I just heard on the, the radio um, that there are several uh, wildfires already uh, raging this year, particular in northern BC and in, uh, northern Alberta. And, uh, well, we're still April, and some of them have already been deemed out of control. Yeah. Yeah. So in April. In, in April, exactly. There's uh, one of them around um, uh, in BC, uh, about 90 kilometers, I think, south of Prince George, someplace called Burgess Creek. Uh, no homes and business are at risk at the moment. Uh, and according to BC Wildfire Service, most of the fires so far this year have been caused uh, by uh, human activity of some kind. Uh, but uh, as they will multiply, of course, uh, we're not really exactly in the thunder and lightning striking season yet. No, so not yet. At this time of year, that would probably be a little uh, normal. Uh, Mr. Grizzly. Yes. Um, there has been some hockey. Yeah, a little bit of hockey. Let's do that hockey. As, uh, okay, because we did not do that on uh, the Sunday, on the Friday show, saying that the playoffs were coming, the playoffs were coming, but of course the playoffs were coming. Uh, there have been some matches so far. So far, three of the four Canadian teams in the playoffs have taken to the ice, and there's two wins and one loss, and I will not let you, uh, I will not even give you three guesses as to the team that lost. <laughs> well, Toronto got spanked 5-1. Spanked, um, and really, it was the first goal was in the first minute. I think, yeah, less than a minute. I think 
it was really a, a, a question of goaltending in that game. It really was. It was uh, the Bruins out goalied them. As simple as that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Which, as anybody knows, in the playoffs, it wasn't like Toronto tender. played awful. Pardon? It's not like Toronto played awful. No, no, they didn't. Uh, they didn't play great, but they didn't play awful. Uh, they weren't even outplayed. I would say they just mm -hmm. uh, they were out goalied. Is what it boils down to. I didn't catch the the Winnipeg or, or Vancouver mm -hmm. games, but uh, they were I quite did. good. in Edmonton, uh, Edmonton won their game too, didn't they? I couldn't even. I was trying to find the info on it, and I was having trouble. Oh, I, I didn't know they had played. I thought yet. they did. Oh no, they play today. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think it's today they play. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a little off to have three start days in playoffs. Usually there's just yeah. two. That's right. But the it's first usually... night of playoffs only had two matches. Yes. Instead you of four. Correct. It yeah. really did throw me. I'm like, what? Huh? Yeah. It's tonight. Uh, yeah. It threw play. me yesterday too. Cause I was looking all over. I said, well, where's the Edmonton match? It hasn't happened yet. Yeah. It's tonight at 10 PM. Well, 10 PM Eastern. Uh, yes. 8 PM yes. Uh, mountain. So, so yeah, I, yeah. I tuned into a uh, Winnipeg, um, ah, forgot who they were playing all of a sudden off. The, Winnipeg horrible. played Colorado, Colorado. Yes. Avalanche seven, six win. Yeah. 13 goal game. I, I came in at four, three in the third period. Oh. Was six goal scored when I was watching. Wow. Yeah. It was a wild Crazy. game. At one point it was like, okay, Winnipeg is okay. Winnipeg has got this now. Like with 27 seconds left, it's like all of a sudden it's a one goal game. It's like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> but uh, that was a fun game, Winnipeg being the first Canadian team uh, to win a Stanley Cup playoff game this round. And then in Vancouver, it was also a gr pretty good match. Uh, not as exciting. 4-1. Uh, the 3-2. No, it was 4-1. Uh, was it 3-2? Shit, I don't know. I thought it was 4-1. The Vancouver match? Yeah. I believe it ended 3-2. Like, I, I could... I thought it was 4 one misremembering, but um, I, I will take a look. Uh, but the Vancouver match was uh, marked with uh, two goals scored in 12 seconds in the third period, which were the fastest two goals ever in, I think, league franchise history. Uh, I'm not sure if that was just for the playoffs or in all. I think it might have been the two fastest goals in franchise history, no matter what. It ended 4-2. Sorry, that was an empty net. 4-2, right? 4-2, yes. yes. I forgot there was an empty netter at the end. Uh, and uh, so that was uh, pretty exciting as well because uh, Vancouver had uh, been trailing or tied uh, in that one uh, all throughout the match until uh, that moment came along. Uh, interesting, and uh, for Vancouver, that was the first playoff game in Vancouver since 2015 because even though Vancouver made the playoffs in 2020, that was the bubble playoffs that all happened in one city. Mm. So they're technically weren't really any home games in the, in that one. And uh, interesting note also on the, the uh, when we were talking, I think it was, did we talk about it? I think it was podcast when we were talking a little bit of hockey, I think, um, on the uh, Boston and uh, Toronto series, when we were, people were thinking like any team but Boston, they were shown some stats during the game. And it seems that um, at no point, any time this season, ever in regular play had the Toronto Maple Leafs led the Boston Bruins in a match. Mm. Not even one. Wow. It was either even score or trailing all season long. And that's, uh, that does not bode well. That's not a good omen. No, it so, is not. But uh, some very, very good hockey. And also when we are speaking hockey, Mr. Grizzly, there was a new record set this weekend in the professional women's hockey league yeah they're 20 21,000 at the bell center in montreal yep they Sounds played like at the that. bell center again toronto against montreal uh toronto winning that one three two i think it was in overtime to clinch top spot and, and clinch a playoff spot as well at the moment sorry not clinch top spot to take control of top spot and right. clinch a playoff spot because the season's not over yet but yes the uh Largest crowd at a P, uh, professional women's hockey league game was originally just over 19,000. The last time uh, there was a match at the Bell Center, and this time it was over 21,000. Gotta love that. Y you just gotta love that. I'm all for it. Let's go, go women, go. Go women, go.
I love this. So yes, um, that's to celebrate there. And also uh, over the weekend, the, the Canadian women's Paralympic basketball team qualified for the Paralympics, matching the men who had done so, I think, just the previous weekend. So uh, good stuff going over there. And uh, going on as well internationally, there's the uh, World Seniors Women's and Men's Curling Championships and the World's Mixed Doubles Championships. And coming out of the weekend uh, in both Team Canada is at top of their uh, pool in round robin play. Uh, I think both of them, both teams have perfect records uh, so far. Um, so uh, lots to cheer about from our Canadian athletes, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more. I took a bit of a weekend off uh, kits and cups, so I, I'm, uh, I didn't go check all the sports this time around. <laughs> all right but there's a lot to be proud of and uh, of course it's just the beginning of playoff season so lots of hockey left to be played hope uh, that everybody enjoys uh what they're doing and uh, doesn't get too personally invested saw this a uh, really funny commercial uh the other day it's about this uh this guy was getting a tattoo and he got a vegas knights logo with 2019 written on it says this is it guys this is the year we're going all the way and the guys are going I hope so. Let's see. Oh, the Vegas Knights are eliminated. <laughs> and you see the guy just slowly pull, rolling the, the shirt of pulling the, the sleeve of his t-shirt down over his tattoo. Yeah. Oopsie. <laughs> so don't get too personally invested. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kids and Cubs. Um, I said that that was the end of uh, the budget news that we had uh, last week. Um, maybe not. Well, I guess I, I guess there's a couple more tidbits. Um, and uh, the first one is that uh, while a lot of people are losing their minds still about the capital gains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know. I know. It's really interesting. Uh, something interesting happened on the weekend. Uh, CTV's question period had Vashi Capellos uh, interview the conservative deputy leader, Melissa Lansman. Now, the last time we kind of sort of heard from her was around the Christmas break uh, when she uh, made herself available to be interviewed only to tell people, uh, I don't have anything to tell you. What about your policies? What about your plans? Uh, you'll find out about that when the election comes, when the election campaign comes. So for the next 18 months, we're just going to keep on saying, axe the tax, build the home, stop the crime, punt the runt. Yeah, kick, yeah. kick the prick, um, whatever. <laughs> well, they're not. Uh, that, but yeah, 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 yeah. We're gonna say it. Cut the crap, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we're just gonna say that for the next eighteen months, and uh, you don't get to know what it is that we're planning. So, uh, of course, she showed up uh, to CTV's question period for Vashi Capellas to ask her whether or not they would maintain the capital gains inclusion or repeal it. And of course, Melissa Lassman was sent there to tell us she's not going to tell us. Yeah, big surprise. Big surprise. Not, not a big surprise at all. The, well, the, apparently, the conservative, the conservative Party wants us to believe that they do not know yet whether or not they would repeal or maintain the increase in the capital gains. In other tax. words, which way is the wind blowing today? Well, they're in a bit of a tough bind. Yeah, They've been trying to say nothing mm -hmm. because, well, they want to let the red Tory section that they think that they still have which I don't believe think. that they will maintain the capital tax inclusion. You know, the actual progressive conservatives who believe in sound management of the fiscal affairs yes. of the nation so that we can have money to take care of the most vulnerable. Yeah. Which the current conservative party has not. Nothing in its con no. nothing in its DNA about helping actual people. Nothing, uh, zero. There's there's no proven track record. None. There's no proven track record of it uh, in the history of the party. Because remember, these are conservatives, not progressive conservatives. And the history of that party starts later, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, they have this, no they have no track. Other than the PPC, this is the most recent of the federal political parties. The Green Party is older mm -hmm. than the Conservative Party of Canada. That's right. Right. So this party, the Conservative Party of Canada, is that has corruption in its DNA that cheated in its first ever, that cheated in the first ever election that it won. Won, skippy air quotes, and pleaded guilty to that in court five years later. Who yeah. is yeah. now led by a leader who has a lifetime deferred prosecution agreement with Elections Canada because he too 
cheated in an cheated. election individually. He We're benefited not this up. From, he benefited from the first cheating, getting his first seat when the party became government, and then he benefited from cheating himself when they told him, don't wear that polo suit that has the big logo of the Conservative Party on it while you're making an announcement about money during the election campaign. But he says, he I want to wear it. And he said, no, 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 we really don't think you should. I want to wear it. And so he wore it. And then they caught him on camera. Which means when he was talking to Elections Canada, he couldn't deny that he had committed the crime. We, we, see, but Elections you, we, Canada see, we see you doing it. <laughs> yes. But Elections Canada said, okay, well, we won't take you to court for this crime if you sign this little paper that promises you will not pull this stunt again or any stunt like it. Watch him do it this next okay. election. Corruption and cheating is in its state. It's the cheating party of Canada, the corruption party of Canada. That's what the first C stands for, not conservative, cheating and corruption. Right? <sighs> okay. So they do not want to tell you whether or not they will keep the inclusion. And then for the business community, business community, sorry, if they were going to keep the inclusion because, well, again, right, conservatives said that they were against the carbon tax, but as we've been finding out, they've been charging it to us all along. They just didn't tell us about it or put it anywhere in their financial statements. Right, Scott Bow? Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, not sure that conservatives are not much more likely to want to give up sweet, sweet, sweet cash that they can do whatever they want with. They're not any more likely to want to give it up than the liberals. Well, and, you know, according to The Guardian, uh, Australia's overall budget balance is the second strongest among G20 nations behind only Canada, according to the International Monetary Fund's latest fiscal monitor. Only Canada is out in front, number one. We have the best balance budget, uh, a budget balance in, in the G20. Hello. Mm -hmm. How do you like so, them apples? Yeah. So when you add that to the fact that we have uh, the lowest marginal tax rate in all of the G7, mm -hmm. and even with the inclusion, the marginal tax rate is pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. And then when you include that uh, we are the third most country attracting foreign direct business, and then when you add that we've got the best debt to GDP ratio of our near peer nations in the G7. We have a lot to offer. We have a lot to offer. So, but uh, that didn't stop. Even though the conservatives are trying to walk that, that, that line, trying to make people believe that there's a chance that they will keep this or a chance that they will repeal it. Um, it's not really a smart strategy because this is getting a lot of press. I mean, it's getting yes. a lot of press. And it's really amazing that all these super rich people are getting so much free press. Again, when I say the people who actually got shafted, among others, got shafted in this budget are the indigenous community because the infrastructure deficit, uh, there's not no real effort made to take a chunk out of that in this budget. And the disability benefit is like 10 cents on the dollar of what was requested. And it's not like the indigenous community and the disability community has as much ability to sway free media. Uh, no. As do people who are stars in the world of business whose opinion is sought. So, um, and uh, of course, with all the money these people have, these people could afford, like the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, for example, uh, actually buy ads mm -hmm. and pay for a campaign. But no, they're getting all the free media. Well, you know, why pay for it if you can get it for free? No, I agreed. Agreed. Hey, I mean, it's good but, sound fiscal. Business. But they're getting all the free media. All the free yeah. media is going to cover their plight, their story. Won't someone think of the millionaires and billionaires? Not the ones, not the stories of the people that have less access to the media. It's not that they turned around and read the budget and said, oh my God, this sucks for indigenous communities. Let's go speak to some indigenous communities. Oh my God, this sucks for indigenous communities in the disability community. Hey, rich people, talk about the capital gains. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about your plight. So, uh, yeah, the conservatives want, them, want us to make us believe that there's a, there exists a reality in which they will not repeal this. 
in order to trick people to get their votes. Um, not sure that that's going to happen. I really um, doubt it. But hey, if they want to create a vacuum and leave the full room for the liberals to say uh, you're standing against fairness and for the NDP to campaign against corporate greed and hold up uh, the conservatives as the champions of corporate greed, that's a bold move, Cotton. As Mr. Grizzly would say, let's see how it works out for you. Uh, there's been lots of confusion. The main source of confusion is people are saying it doesn't really affect the top 0.13% because let's say if you're one mm -hmm. of the 8% of people in Canada who owns a cottage, that's a second home. If you sell that, well, you'll get ding. So that means more than, okay, we need to make a difference between people who will have one-time or two-time dispositions in their entire lives. Right. And people who routinely report over $250,000 in capital gains annually. <laughs> right. This law is intended to grab the second group. The first group, there are tons of things you can do. People have been talking about independent professionals like doctors. Uh, like this, well, you know, we our, our, our doctor's practice and all that kind of stuff. You know, was, uh, I take my salary from, from the capital gains. Well, nothing says you can't take salaries in, in, a, in a different financial structure. I mean, if you're not planning to sell your business in the next year or two, you have time to change your financial planning strategies to avoid the majority of that hit. Number two, if you happen to be one of these people that has a cottage, and people make the comment, for example, except for in Northern Ontario, if you have a cottage, chances are it's valued over $250,000. It's not the value. It's not how much you're going to sell your cottage for. It's not if you sell your cottage for over $250,000, you get dinged by the inclusion. It's if the difference in the price between the time you got it and the time you sold it is over $250,000. So while there may be 8% of the Canadian population that has a cottage and most of them have a cottage valued over $250,000, it's not necessarily the case that that 8% has a cottage that is appreciated in value greater than $250,000 since they got it. That's the metric how much it's appreciated in value since you got it, not how much you can sell it for. Right? You can see by all. Yes, <laughs> indeed. I'm spending my extra $200 per month on Lamborghinis and yachts. We sure fooled those billionaires. Well, can you see by all? I thought you were more of a hookers and blow kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> Peg Jurong. Could have also been beer and popcorn. Yeah, <laughs> Smokes. <laughs> yeah. Just, God, man. <laughs> so yeah, many people Ellen. have don't been hoodwinked. Yes. Don't sell everything all at once. You have yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And you also have an extra $250,000 uh, lifetime disposition. Now, where people are starting expre expressing some concern, they're also saying, well, small business owners, small, medium business owners. Um, I heard because there was some confusion because the capital gains inclusion rate, um, the first 250000 is the same as it always was for individuals. And then after $250,000 in gains for every dollar above that, 66% of that is included for taxation at your normal taxation rate rather than 55%. Rather than 50%, sorry. Um, for small business owners, again, it's the same thing. It's whether or not the appreciation of your business uh, has grown two hundred fifty thousand dollars since you got since you got it or you started it. But with the three hundred thousand largest corporations and trusts, there's no baseline amount. If you happen to be a small business owner, and this is where the confusion seemed to be coming from, most of all, people were saying, "Well, what if I own my own, my own small business? You know, I'm going to get dinged with that." According to Rishi Valdez, who's the Minister of Small Business on Question Period on CTV on Sunday, small, medium businesses are treated the same way as individuals. Oh, interesting. So your first 250000 was there. And plus the small and medium businesses, about 600000 of them estimated, will now be getting the Canada carbon rebate on their small business practices and their lifetime exemption. How much they can sell their business for capital gains has now gone up to 1.25 million wow. from 1 million. So there have been some. So again, when they say that, yes, it's true, there might be a small or medium business that doesn't, uh, that's not among the top 300,000 that has grained over $250,000 in value. And 
you know, that person upon disposition would be affected by this. So yes, I guess it ends up being a little more than 0.13, but that would be, again, a one-time disposition for which people can make financial plans for eventual disposition now and start changing them to not get hit uh, as much as possible. And remember, when it comes to capital gains, also the concept of capital losses, right? Your capital gains are deductible, but your capital losses are also reportable. And uh, once you have capital losses, well, then those would go, of course, go against your lifetime, uh, your lifetime amount as well. So, you know, uh, when, so if you uh, take your money and you reinvest it in what it is you're reinvesting and it doesn't do so well, when you dispose of that, you make a loss, you get to write all of that. So you don't eat all of the loss as well. Mm. Right. So those rules. Just, so you've got all of these things to consider. So it's very easy to stand there on the, on the internet and say, you know, this, this is going to make doctors' offices dry up, and this is going to dry up, dry up investment and all that kind of stuff. During Byron Mulroney's period, our capital gains inclusion rate was seventy-five percent. In the United States, presently, right now, the capital gains inclusion rate is one hundred percent. Yeah. So, so again, we're, the capital is going to go flowing. What to a country with a one hundred percent inclusion because we raised from fifty to sixty-six? Really? 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 Fear conquering. Of course. Fear conquering. So just Let's say a lot of people want you to be afraid for your jobs. That's what, there's going to be no innovation. They're not going to invest. Somebody said, you know, turned around and said, oh, well, gee, yeah, great move. Great move. Dinging the employers, dinging the business and job creators. Yeah, yeah. So next time when you go into your boss's office and ask for a raise, Good luck to you. Thanks, Trudeau. Trudeau just killed your opportunity to get a raise if you go in and ask for one. So if you have to go into your boss's office and ask for a raise because you weren't offered one proactively, just saying. Mm -hmm. Not sure that that boss... I don't know of many instances. I know it happens, but I do not know of many instances of people who came in and says, hey, I went to work today, and my boss proactively came into my office and says, you know what? You're getting a raise. Yeah, that doesn't happen. <laughs> I get Once a year, I get a review, and if I'm lucky... Well, actually, I get a raise every year, but I'm still below the middle class. Income. But yours is contractually uh, obligated, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. Exactly. So unless you're con so your raise is contractually obligated, so your boss doesn't come into the office and says, "Hey, you've done. You know what? Even though you had a contractually obligated raise, your work has been so good. I'm going to go over and above and give you an extra X Y Z an hour." Well, I did per year. I, I did get a um, the the average uh, raise is three point five percent. I was able to get four. He wanted to give me five, but they just wouldn't allow it. Funny thing was, we just had a meeting the other day annual shareholder, you know, mm -hmm. overview of the company, record year, record profits, record growth. Uh-huh. Should also come with record wage growth. Wouldn't you think? Uh, aren't we the ones who build the company? Yeah. No. yeah. It's just how it is, man. Yeah. Yeah. I got to bend over and take it. I don't have a choice. Yes. Not in a position to say, screw you, you know? <laughs> but it is kind of interesting that for... This is the first time in a long time that I've seen a conservative party not want to nestle up and snuggle real close to some type of policy that would make life better. Yeah, for the business community, it's the first they, they, that they're not that they are not standing out there and saying we will repeal this. This is outrageous. It is very, very, very notable. It is what we call new behavior. And when you are uh, someone who uh, analyzes behavior, new behavior that appears suddenly out of nowhere for no logical or rational reason is something you pay attention to and ask questions about. It is abnormal for conservatives to not wanting to be rushed to a, not wanting to rush to a microphone and a camera and saying, oh my God, they're taxing job creators. And we get in power, we're going to repeal this. Mm -hmm. They're not doing that. That's weird. Ask yourselves why. Pay attention. Because there's something going on here. Someone's not being honest. 
True. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in other news, Kits and Cubs, um, it's not, well, it wouldn't have been political news. It would have just been a sort of crime and justice story had it not been for the fact um, that, well, one, it involved a police officer who was duty, on duty at the time. And if it wasn't because of comments that uh, people had made some time ago. Now, I will read you, or I'll ask Mr. Grizzly actually to read you the comment. This was from Doug Ford on September 22nd, 2021. When the person yes. who had I'm committed... glad you went there. I had this queued up to go. All right. So, so September 22nd, uh, on September 22nd 2021. 2021, breaking a 31 year old man charged with first degree murder in the death of Toronto police constable Jeffrey Northrop has been released on bail. Doug Ford's reaction was this is beyond comprehension. It's completely unacceptable that the person charged for this heinous crime is now out on bail. Our justice justice system needs to get its act together and start putting victims and their families ahead of criminals. Okay. Now what's the word before crime? <laughs> I'm sorry. What is the word that precedes crime in Doug Ford's tweet? This is beyond uh, heinous crime, yes. Heinous crime. So the guy is charged with first degree murder in the death of a Toronto police officer. Doug Ford says, I can't believe this. This is a heinous crime. I can't believe. Look at our bail system. What was the crime? You might want to ask. July 2nd, 2021, just past midnight, after Canada Day celebrations, a man, his pregnant wife, and two-year-old son are in their car in a parking garage below Toronto City Hall, when suddenly, out of the blue, three people, or a group of people, not sure how many, in plain clothes, rush up to the car and start banging on the windows. Guy panics, takes off, hits Northrop, Northrop dies. Mm -hmm. A heinous crime. The jury bought this man's defense that he had no idea who these people were, didn't know why they were coming to his car, they just started banging like this, he panicked and just rove. Feared for his life, feared for his wife, feared for his son, feared for himself, and drove. Standard fight or flight reaction, right? The jury accepted that defense. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Doug Ford inserted himself into the justice system, premiers, elected officials should never, ever, ever be mm -hmm. expressing their opinion on an active criminal case while it is going on, ever. Well, it just shows complete lack of judgment on his part. Ever. And, and from John Tory, who was mayor at the time, our city continues to mourn the death of Constable Northrup. It is almost impossible to imagine a circumstance in which an accused in a case of first-degree murder would be granted bail. So they both had this man convicted before a trial. Yes. Now, the, the reason the he was... Now, the reason for which he is convicted, he was charged for first degree murder, is that by law in Ontario, if someone kills a police officer, regardless of the reason, it's an automatic charge of first degree mm -hmm. murder, mm -hmm. even if it's in self-defense. So again, it's not like it was like, when you say first first degree murder, you think of like pre premeditated murder, right? Somebody who thought about it, somebody who's hiding in the mm -hmm. shadows, lurking, waiting for someone to come along, someone that they picked or they tragic targeted. Accident. Or... Yep. Well, and the cameras, according to Linda, says the cameras in the garage supported his story as well as one of the Crown's crime scene investigators. Yeah. And the this judge man, gave a rare yeah. apology. Exactly. That's where I was going. So yeah. the judge apologized. It's to incredibly the defendant rare. for everything yeah. that he and his family had been through. This case should have never, ever gone to trial. Well, just, he says here from the judge, he says, um, Mr. Zamir, you're free to go, sir. 
This is Superior Court Justice Anne Malloy. You have my deepest apologies for what you have been through. It's, it's, uh, yeah. 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 And now you're hearing, and the other reason why this has become an issue is because the uh, Toronto chief of police also thought that it was a smart idea to make a comment with regard oh. to this. And do you have that comment, sir? Uh, do you have it handy? No, I don't. I don't. Okay. I'm trying to find then it. I will, I will have it for you. Uh, and I hope, I really hope, that uh, this man who was acquitted isn't a particularly litigious person. Because uh, the chief of police kind of stepped in it with this comment. Chief, I'm guessing his name is Demkiw, D-M-K-I-W. And uh, on the record, as uh, saying, mm. while we respect the judicial process and appreciate the work of the 12 citizens who sat on a very difficult case, I share the feelings of our members who were hoping for a different outcome. Mm. I will guess that in Discovery Toronto Police, Received a copy of that video? Oh, yeah. They would have. They know what happened on that video. They saw what happened on that video. And still, even though you know that this is an innocent man, and even though you know that the judge, a jury was just, a jury just declared this man to be innocent. So, and he was innocent, and so obviously so to the point that the judge apologized to the man and then you come out and you say you wish for a different outcome. Question, inconvenient question. Why would you, chief of police of the Toronto Police Services, a man who has taken an oath to serve and protect, wish for a different outcome than not guilty in a case where someone was not guilty? Do you want me to put some Jeopardy thinking music on an endless loop for you while you try to come up for an answer on that one, sir? Mm. Why? There are times where the standard go-to boilerplate answer doesn't work and you need to engage your brain for three seconds before you belly up to a microphone and a camera and say what you would normally say in these types of situations and ask yourself whether or not that's going to be a good look. This would have been one of them. Yeah, no kidding. I, if the premier of the province were anyone but Doug Ford, because we know that he has a very, very cozy relationship with uh, the Toronto Police Services, all we have to do is, and OPP, and all we have thank to you. Do is think, OPP, all we have to do is uh, think about uh, the gravy plane. Yes, I was just going to go there. Yeah. Um, this chief would probably be fired. Oh, yeah. Would be demanding his resignation at some point soon. As chief of police, you cannot afford the public image of being someone who thinks that clearly innocent or not guilty people should have been convicted and sent to jail anyway. Yeah, that's not a good look. Not yeah. a good look. Not a good look. <sighs> Just. Yeah. I, I hear you. Exhausted. Exasperated. The chief. Day. Yeah. You got a tweet here from George Bell. And it was, he puts it really well for for us. Here's the thing. The chief shouldn't be hoping for justice and for due process. What is the different outcome than he wants? Injustice? Undue process? If so, he needs to resign. Here is the oath. If you wanted a different outcome, then you're not being impartial. Two, the oath or affirmation of office to be taken by a police officer, special constable, or First Nations constable shall be in one of the following forms. 
one, I solemnly swear or affirm that I will be loyal to her, well, his majesty, the king, and to Canada, and that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada, and that I will, to the best of my ability, preserve the peace, prevent offenses, and discharge my other duties as faithfully, impartially, and according to the law. So help me God. Or, I solemnly swear or affirm that I will be loyal to Canada and that I will uphold the Constitution of Canada and that I will, to the best of my ability, preserve the peace, prevent offenses, and discharge my other duties faithfully, impartially, and according to the law. So help me God. That I will uphold the Constitution of Canada. Mm. The Constitution of Canada provides for bail. Yeah. So maybe the you Constitution should. of Canada provides for due process, and the Constitution of Canada provides for the fact that if you were misaccused of a crime and you go through the legal process, and if you are found not guilty, you are an innocent man or person. And pretty, that's where it ends, simple, right? Pretty simple. I mean, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not so rocket surgery. That one comment from the chief, and mm -hmm. that comment back ago from the premier gives him the grounds for a very, very, very interesting defamation suit. Both had better hope that this person is not litigious. Because if he sues them, he will win. Because oh, yeah. these are people, the premier is someone who should know better than to describe a crime as heinous here. when he doesn't know whether or not it is just because a police officer just because a police officer died at the hands of another person in a line of duty does not necessarily always 100% of the time mean that mm -hmm. a crime was committed. Most of the time it might be, mm -hmm. but not all the time. And you have to talk. It is your duty as an elected official and to which, into whom we have put public trust. To speak as if it is possible that it did not happen, not as if it absolutely did happen. Lock them up. Your job is to defend rights and due process. Not a judicial outcome you would want. It's not how it's done. It's not how it's done. Well, All right. here's some words from Mr. Uh, Zamir. These are not mm. just, these are angels. And I can't think enough, the whole Canada. I see that today. Canada didn't let injustice to happen. Mm. He said that the jury's decision affirmed his decision to come to Canada. Mm -hmm. And this was not a country that allowed injustices to stand. Plain and simply put, yes. Yeah. There you go. Um, yeah, this is not not impressed. Not impressed with this one. In other news, kids and cubs, <clears throat> if I may, mm. jury selection went a little faster than some people thought it would. The entire jury. And the six alternates were chosen on Friday, which means that today, 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 kiddies, is the first day of actual arguments in, thankfully, former President Trumpito Chitolini's first of four criminal trials. Thus, putting him forever in the history books as the first former or president. president of the United States to face a criminal trial. Now, other nations like Brazil or France, well, they've had that happen before. This is not new for them. But for the United States in nearly 300 years of existence, this is the first time. And even though Everybody keeps on telling us that no man is above the law. So far, we've been getting quite a clear lesson that at least one is. So, yes. Opening arguments will start today. Um, 
there will also be uh, a hearing tomorrow to talk about uh, Trump having violated uh, the terms of his uh, release uh, to be able to remain out of uh, prison while the trial is going on. Uh, looks like they are looking for three thousand dollars in fines, one for every one of the every three instances that he's uh, done something like talked about Stormy Daniels or Michael Cohen or the judge's daughter, which mm-hmm. he's not supposed to talk about at all in the press. Uh, yeah, and uh, Becker's testimony is going to be interesting. Yes, indeed. And uh, while people are saying that there's probably little chance that Trump will be going to jail for this, given it's his first offense, let's remember that uh, his former lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen, mm-hmm. was tried mm-hmm. and convicted. For very similar crimes. And he was convicted to three years in jail. Listen. Everybody's been doing the kid gloves thing with Trump, so odds are that there's going to be two standards of justice for him yet again. Mm -hmm. But I find it really, really, really weird and hard to explain how it is that somebody that went to jail got sentenced to jail for three years. He didn't serve a full three years. But that got sentenced for three years for having participated in the crime would get less time than the person at whom's direction and for whom's benefit the crime was committed even seems like it should be a higher standard or a higher crime because in order to commit your crime, you made, you did the work of roping in a whole bunch of other people to help you commit it so that you yourself wouldn't get your hands dirty. So you could have plausible deniability. That seems like a whole lot of premeditation, but that's just me. <laughs> so uh we'll keep track on that uh clearly um sir farts a lot is probably not gonna well he's not gonna like this and he's gonna whine and complain about all this kind of stuff forever but you know that's just what he does so uh seven women five men on the jury and um also really interesting that uh there are actually some lawyers among the jury which is Usually pretty rare. Usually uh, DAs and defense attorneys do not like it when there are attorneys on the jury, typically. Because uh, they sometimes tend to have uh, bigger personalities in the jury room because, well, they know the law, even though, let's say, they are a civil law expert and whatnot. And sometimes people in the jury room tend to defend them, so if they have a particular point of view and have a big personality, they can often drag people along. Uh, but then some people sometimes would want them on a case like this because allegedly they are supposed to have the ability to be, you know, dispassionate and uninvolved and being able to separate facts and keep things in separate boxes and, uh, you know, be analytical. So, uh, but apparently this is, uh, very rare. So, mm-hmm. And, uh, it seems that the prosecution is also looking for the judge Juan Marchand to uh, specifically inform uh, the former president that should he violate his terms one more time, that the next one will be coming with jail time. Mm. Which uh, I think, it seems to me anyway, it seems to be the case that he's really looking for that to happen. Because he knows that if he gets sentenced to jail, even for one week, he can be sentenced up to 30 days this that all of a sudden it's like hey cha-ching fundraising city look at me i'm being persecuted yeah of course um he's having some diminishing returns because also on the weekend came the news and this is going to make you smile mr grizzly uh that um, well you know that recently the rnc the republican national congress mm-hmm. the organization that has been uh, that was created to try and help the republicans not only the president, but all of them down ballot also win elections. Well, Trump replaced Ronna McDaniel, Ronna Romney McDaniel, who somehow dropped the name Romney from her last name around the time that Mitch Romney was running for president. Um, so Ronna McDaniel was heading it. And um, well, uh, Trump arranged to have her um, removed as the chair and uh, replaced uh, the chair by uh, his daughter-in-law, Lara Trump. Mm-hmm. And it seems that uh, the Republican National Committee has been directed that every single cent must be going to getting Trump reelected and not to help anybody down ballot. 
Well, Joe Biden has been outraising Trump a lot. Oh, yeah. Of course, Trump has been burning through the money as well. So it seems that uh, Trump sent a little letter down to all the down ballot candidates um, saying something like, um, um, well, things around here are going to change. So uh, now if you're doing fundraising efforts, if you are using my name or my likeness in any way, uh, you need to send us, you need to send us a minimum of 5% of what it is that you raise. 5% is the minimum you need to send us, but anything over 5% you send us will be favorably viewed by the organizing committees of these two organizations and are regularly reported up to the highest instances of these organizations. Normally, the RNC raises money and gives some to the down-ballot candidates to help them. Now Trump is saying, hey, you're raising money, you're using my name, or you're using my image, I get a cut. Thus making it harder for people down-ballot to win. The maximum Indeed. individual donation is 6600 so for any maximum, any maximum individual donation, Trump is basically looking to get $330 of it. And then anything more, of course, will be noted by the good people at the Trump Organization and remembered. So that seems to be a, a open invitation to everybody down ballot. It was like, hey, you know what? Uh, if you're uh, running in the next federal election down ballot and uh, you know you want to increase your chances of getting a cabinet position or a committee chair, if you donate a little more than the five percent of your take, that will be favorably remembered when it comes time. Step right up, buy your future position, put a down payment on it. Totally ethical and legal. <laughs> it's just, you know you're doing bad when instead of being the person who's making it rain on down ballot candidates, because you're asking for donation money to trickle up to you. <laughs> yeah, that'll keep the family nice and unified <laughs> for the run up to the. Oh, God. <laughs> this guy. Literally a one man crime spree and a one man pyramid scheme. Yep. He's literally turning political fundraising into a pyramid scheme. Unbelievable. Oh, man. The other big news, uh, and this is also U.S. news, but it is very, very, very important to Canada, actually. Um, the foreign aid bill in the United States finally passed. Now, originally, it was a bill that had passed the Senate. It originally in the Senate was had $95 billion in foreign aid going to Ukraine, to Israel, for Taiwan, a couple of other measures internationally. And uh, it had uh, been stalled in the House because, well, you know, the Marjor Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene faction, well, we don't want to give any money to Ukraine whatsoever anymore. We're done with that. Not understanding or pretending, sorry, that they didn't understand that allowing Ukraine to be able to be annexed is probably not in the best interests long term of the United States of America, but they don't seem to care about that. Um, but Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, had decided to try to split the bill into four or five little bills. One bill specifically on Ukraine, one specifically on Israel, specifically on Taiwan, one specifically on uh, border security, and one uh, else other thing having to do with something with TikTok or something, to try to get people out to vote on them individually, hoping that you know money for Israel would be approved and leaving the chance theoretically that money from Ukraine would be disapproved and that that way he could get through uh, all the brouhaha that's going because uh, since he made a deal with Democrats to actually pass a budget so that the United States didn't default on its debts and have its credit rating go tanking, getting tanked, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene was like, okay, well, uh, you know, I want you to be removed as speaker because remember the Republicans set the rule that all it's needed is one person to ask for it to actually start the process to see if they're going to vote on that. Uh, so she's trying to threaten him and uh, they're trying to say, you know, okay, well now you're going to lose your job because you, you know, 
did the responsible thing and made sure that the United States didn't default on their debts because we're being unreasonable. We want you to do that just to prove a point. And well, you voted against us and voted with Democrats, so you betrayed us. So you got to go. We need to do to you what we did to a, a previous guy. So while she's uh, trying to get that done, um, he passed, uh, he put these all into packages, and it seems that uh, the one on Ukraine passed by a vote of 311 to 112 with one person voting present. So um, uh, that Republican anti-everything faction didn't have as much support even among its own peers. Because I mean, they have a majority in the House of two votes. Yeah. Three and one, 311 to 112, that's more than a two-vote spread. That means a lot of Republicans voted for the bill for Ukraine. So about $61 billion is going to be to going to Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel. There's going to be money for Taiwan. There's another $9.1 billion for other humanitarian needs. Uh, Russian president, uh, Russian president, Ukrainian president, ooh, sorry, if only it was the Russian president. <laughs> Ukrainian president Volodymyr Zelensky issued a video thanking both the American people and Speaker Johnson directly. That probably won't be good for him. <laughs> <laughs> with the Yahoo faction uh, for their help in getting the package through. Quote, uh, he says, it provides for great account... Uh, Mike Johnson says that the bill as it is now provides for greater accountability over Ukraine aid, forces an endgame strategy for the Ukraine war. It includes a loan instrument uh, for the foreign aid to Ukraine and a repo act to ensure that Russian assets pay for part of the bill. So basically, Mike Johnson said, listen, you know, it's not all given. Now some of this is structured as forgivable loans, which is the same thing as donating the money in this case, but mm -hmm. because he can say loans, say that he has been more responsible with the nation's finances because it's not all just given money. Some of it is loans, but they're forgivable loans. So well, we had, a, we had a comment on one of the shorts um, from somebody saying, 60 billion to Ukraine, ha, ha, ha. I'm like, uh, we're Canadian. <laughs> it's not our money. Right. So you're, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> what about the 60 billion? I'm like, we're Canadian. Sorry. Yep. You're hey. talking about how we're a rich country and we can put an end to housing. He's like, 60 billion to Ukraine. We're Canadian. Yep. <laughs> Not our money. No. Nope. Sorry. We're perfectly fine with the U.S. doing whatever it wants to do with its money. Yeah. I, uh, it's your money. Your house, your rules. <laughs> I mean, we won't tell you how to spend your money. Don't tell us how to spend ours. Have a nice life. I think, I think that's a pretty good uh, rule to live by, right? Yeah. Exactly. So. <laughs> I mean, exactly, yeah, yeah. Come on, man. Yeah, Linda, sorry, wrong number. Sir, yeah. this is a Wendy's drive through <laughs> so, I'm sorry, sir, this is a bikini village. We don't have a quarter pounder here. Uh, <laughs> oh, by the way, happy Earth Day. Yes, it is Earth, Earth Day. I forgot today. that. Also, yeah, happy... Happy as young as you, for people that are going to be complaining. I, I have a feeling that there won't be people on the left complaining that other people have made Earth Day also their day. As it was the case for Easter when Transgender Day of Visibility happened. But in case you are one of those people, please calm down. Because it's also National As Young As You Feel Day, National Coco Vain Day, National it's Gryffindor Pride Day. It's International Talk Like William Shatner Day. Oh, I didn't know that was a day. Uh, yes. Yes. National Bavari Bavarian Crepes Day. <laughs> National Goof Off Day. Oh, and that World Water Day. And National Sing Out Louise Day. Just Sing Out Day. The Louise is my editorial ad. Anyway, uh, so there you go. <laughs> but hey. Feel free to get upset about any of it if you want. Yes, exactly. But if you happen to be doing something, happen to be giving back to Mother Earth today, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. She's a good lady. She doesn't get enough love. She certainly doesn't get enough respect. Especially from conservatives. I'm noticing a trend. <laughs> Gee. Oh. 
Oh, Pierre Polyev is going MGTOW on Mother Nature. Oh, really? What did he do? No, that would be the spin. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. He Sorry. respects no women, not even Mother Nature. Uh, huh? Yeah. Huh? Fair enough. Liberal Party, if you're watching, feel free to use it. <laughs> oh, man. Um, there was one thing uh, I forgot to mention uh, when we were talking about hockey. Um, a moment that I really liked. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks came. Um, two people came to sing the national anthems. I'm guessing the person who sang the American anthem was uh, was American. Um, did a great uh, did a great version of it. Um, you know, but as often is the case with the, the American anthem, there you know, a lot of singers will do some things with the runs and you know, jazz it up or spice mm -hmm. it up somehow. You know, show mm -hmm. here. You know, here's my opportunity to show my vocal prowess. You know, and he did really well. He had some really cool runs. He was very cool and all that kind of stuff. You know, a little bit of flash in the way he dressed. And then, total, complete contrast. They brought oh. in a lady, a young lady named Elizabeth Irving to sing Oh Canada. And whereas he did the runs and whatnot, she just sang the song. Mm. Simply sang the song. While he was dressed flashy, she simply had a white blazer over a black t-shirt, ponytail, uh, those of you who uh, may be of a certain age will uh, remember ivory soap commercials and they had the concept of the ivory girl. Yes. She literally looked like the stereotypical ivory girl. Fun right. fact. White, bla sold out. White blazer, black t-shirt, ponytail, not really big done up. And then she starts singing Oh Canada and somewhere in the middle of it because, hey, for an amateur singer, being invited to an NHL game to sing Oh Canada when the cameras are on is like, that's like a big deal. It's a lot of things that a lot of student stars end up doing when they're younger. They usually have that moment. And like that's probably the biggest moment, the biggest audience they've ever had. So they'll do something, right? They'll take up all the moment. Somewhere in the middle of it, because the whole audience was singing, everybody that had gathered to sing O Canada, she just like lifted up the mic and let the audience sing. She actually gave some of her moment. So I just thought that the contrast was like, wow, that is like very American on one and very Canadian on the other. And both of them worked in their own way. It was beautiful to see. But uh, Elizabeth Irving, I don't know if there's anybody who's watching this who might happen to know her, but uh, props to you. Props to you for taking your moment and actually sharing it. Because O Canada isn't a long song. No. <laughs> well, I mean, if you sing all the verses and whatnot, yes, but <laughs> it's a longer song. Yeah, if you, yeah but, we've not done that. In 1980, it became the official national anthem, and they dropped a few verses just to keep it, you know, under two minutes. Yeah. You were going to say, Mr. Grizzly? Well, I was going to say an interesting fun fact about Ivory Snow Girl. Did you know that late uh, actress, adult film actress, Marilyn Chambers, was an Ivory Snow Girl? I did not know that. Yeah, here, let me show you the picture. Uh, this is uh, her in the box of an ivory, ivory Snow with the baby. That's Marilyn oh, Chambers. I remember Ivory Snow. I haven't seen Ivory Snow in forever. Well, and so that uh, campaign came to an abrupt halt when they found out that she was making pornographic or adult films, whatever you want to call it. Call it whatever you want, you know. But yeah, that's uh, a little known fact. I guess you could say. Mm. And matter okay. of fact, in, in the film, because she was the star of the film behind the green door, and there's a shot at the beginning of the film where that she goes to pull something out of her linen closet, and that box of ivory snow is dead center of the frame. I've seen the oh. screen cap of it. So I read about it, right? and I watched a documentary about her. Fascinating person. She yeah, passed away 2009. Okay. She's kind of young, actually. She was, uh, how old was she? 56. Yeah, yeah. You're older than I am right now. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, little note for, I forgot to mention uh, when we was talking about the, the U.S. funding uh, uh, of the $26 billion for Israel, uh, one third of that amount is destined for people in uh, need of humanitarian aid, including in Gaza as well. So um, just uh, give an update on that. Um, when it, uh, I was also busy a little bit uh, before the weekend. Uh, 
Pierre, uh, I've got a couple of fact checks for you. Kids oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Pierre Poliev has been uh, all over the news uh, for the past years saying that uh, Trudeau has doubled the debt. Trudeau has doubled rents. Mm. Trudeau has yes, doubled, he doubled housing rents. prices. Yes. No. Uh, everything. I sat there and I thought, like, well, how possible is it really that all three of these things specifically have doubled? Right? Maybe one of them actually 1.5 times did. Or one point, but what are the odds that all three of these specifically had doubled? I'm going to say slim. Uh, I, you know, Mr. Grizzly, you actually might have a point there. So, um, as you know, our friend uh, JB from Canadian Politics 101, CDN Politics 101, uh, is starting this initiative called Pierre is Lying with a whole bunch of people. Yes. And uh, they go through and uh, they look through his lies. And uh, I went to look at one of their things. And then, you know, JB says what the lie is and then points to a source. And then I went to the source and, um, and then looked at the data that he was looking at. And I decided to try to um, look at other things and draw more numbers from it. And we made the comment when it comes to rent, well, that well, Pierre Podiev is a landlord. Yes. Right? So how much did he charge for rent before eight years of Justin Trudeau and after eight years of Justin Trudeau? Well, did they, he, they started saying nine years now. Yeah, you know, now it's nine, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But it's like, would you, um, did you, do you care so much about this rent issue that for the rent you yourself are charging, decided in your personal life, oh, no, no, this is just too much. I, I couldn't charge this to the people to whom I'm charging rent because it's so unfair. Or did you again, are you again one of these conservatives who say, no, 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 but you always took the dough because you always gave the maximum rent increase and mm -hmm. you're charging as much as the market would allow. And? Well, I don't know about Pierre specifically, right? Well, I have been told that, that he charges but, Michael Cooper $28,000 a year in rent. Well, well, there's there's the maximum you can charge. We don't know if he is charging. But Pierre doesn't strike me as someone, given his spending as leader of the opposition. <laughs> I would say, well, you know what? We're allowed to charge $30,000 a year yeah, to so an we'll MP and say, you know what? I know I'm allowed to charge thirty, but... I'm only going to charge 20 because, you know, I can afford that and it's the taxpayer that's paying it. And plus, you know, I want to be fair to my renter. Yeah. 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 Right. So. <sighs> what a racket. So just, well, it's one of these things, you know, it's like while you're telling, if you were a landlord and you are going all across TV saying, oh my God, rents are too high. Uh, and then I said, okay, well, how did you treat people who rent from you? seems to be an obvious question. It seems to be a fair question. So that answer, that that's a question to which we do not know the answer. But after eight years of Justin Trudeau, rent has doubled. Is this truth or is this Pierre Polièvre? Another case of you can't spell lie or can't spell Polièvre without lie. Yes. Well, according to the CMHC, because the little link that uh, JB's uh, Pierre's lying sheet actually uh, put out um, has something led to a place that has longitudinal historical information on house prices. So I'm not sure how clear this will be uh, to, this, to the kits because it's relatively gray on my screen, but hopefully it will be. Nope, that's not going to work. Okay, Mr. Grizzly, I don't, not sure. You can show it on the screen, but I'm not sure how, how, how it's going to come across. Oh, yeah, okay, you see it. So, same HG every October tells you what the average price is in Toronto. This is for Toronto, of a bachelor. So, here in, uh, in October uh, 2015, 
uh, an average bachelor was 937. The average one bedroom was 1,103. The average two bedroom, 1,286. The average three bedroom, 1,516. Overall, 1,208. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's in October 1995. In October of 2023, it's 1,414 1, for a bachelor, 1,691 for one bedroom, 1,958 for two bedroom, 2,168 for three bedroom, 1,830 overall. So when you do the math, rents have gone up 51.5%. The average one bedroom in Toronto has gone up 51.5% since 2015, not 100%. Mm as Pierre claims. Now, here's another fact. When the CPC, the Conservative Party of Canada, formed government, the government of which Pierre boasts having been the housing minister, the average rent for a one-bedroom was 995. The average rent October 2023 is 1830. That means average rent has increased 84% since Harper became prime minister 18 years ago. It hasn't even doubled since Harper became prime minister <laughs> close to but hasn't actually doubled but pierre wants you to make wants you to believe that it's doubled over the last 8 years when it hasn't even doubled over the last 18 well you know if you're going to lie tell a big one i guess <laughs> except make it one that's believable instead of just lying so boldly that we can just let's do a quick uh, fact check here oh yeah that's that's total garbage it's not even based in reality it's just it, <laughs> it's just dumb. so then i thought well he keeps on saying after eight years of justin trudeau housing prices have doubled is this a case of you can't spell polyev without lie well jb sent us to another place to look at this history of prices and well right here you have canada real estate market trends and on november 2015 if you'll uh, show the visual mr grizzly Just the average second. sold price for a house was 454,184 in february 2024 which is the most recent data the average sold price is 685,804 now is 685,000 twice 454,000? Uh, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. Because housing prices only went up 51% since Trudeau became prime minister and not 100%. 450 as, uh, twi doubled is, is 900, and that's not 900. So No, no, no. And fun fact as well, the CPC government, for which Pierre claims to have been housing minister, ruled from February 2006 to November 2015. The average house sale price in February 2006 was 266593 and in November 2015, when they left office, was 454184 for an average sale price increase of, drumroll please, 70%. Yeah. The price of houses went up 70%. 70% during the Harper government and have only gone up 51% in the Trudeau government. So not only have housing prices not doubled while Prime Minister Trudeau was Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, the, houses, the prices of houses haven't even gone up as much as they did when Pierre Poliev claims he was housing minister for the nation. The liberal performance is better. Funny that. They, they need to bring that up, um, you know, just to straighten the facts out. And, and media, when, when Polyev is on your program spewing these lies, you should fact check him with that one right there. Because that kind of torpedoes his, his efforts to, to, to lie to you. When you can tell him, no, um, housing's gone up 51% under Trudeau, under you it was 71%. Uh, care to explain that? Can we have a number? Can we have a number, Pierre? Can we have a number? How about a number? <laughs> Jesus. This friggin' guy, I'm telling you. Right? It's enough to make you want a drink in the morning. 
<laughs> Maybe some eggnog. It's not Christmas. It's some Canadian club or whatever. Oh, yeah. His, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. His magic potion drink there, whatever, with his wife. That... <laughs> with a handle uh, of Crown Royal, by the way. And then, well, he also likes to tell us, after eight years of Justin Trudeau, the debt has doubled. Once again. Is this true? Another instance of you can't spell Polyev without lie. Yeah, yes. I uh, hear. I bet you all said it at the same time as I did, too. Well, after eight years of Dustin Trudeau, the debt has doubled, says Pierre Polyev. Well, according to Pierre Zalain website, government debt is measured by economists and Federal Reserves as percentage to GDP, not dollars and cents based on the widely accepted measurement by experts. So, let's look at that. When the Polyev Harper group assumed governing office in 2006, the debt-to-GDP ratio was about 43.3%. When they were given the boot in 2015, seven years after the 2008 crash and the Great Recession, our debt-to-GDP ratio had risen to 56%. Had gone up mm. 13%. Seven years after. So, again, when we compare, right? I did this thing. I said, well, you, you need to remember that uh, the conservatives didn't have a global pandemic to deal with. So, yeah, but they had the Great Recession. Yes, it's true. And that was big and it, 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 it had a big impact, but it didn't have the impact of shutting down the entire world. No. COVID. no. Like, not even close. This was a walk in no. the park. And COVID seven years, right? seven years. After the crash hit, mm -hmm. debt to GDP ratio was rising under Harper and Polyev. And if people want to see it, I am happy to show it because central government debt, total percentage of GDP for Canada. Now, this is just the federal share. Sometimes right. when you're looking to jet, debt to GDP ratio, you will see like 103%, 106%. Mm -hmm. That is federal and provincial debt combined. Right. But federal and debt provincial only. Provincial debt has, has got nothing to do with the prime minister. Exactly. But the GDP, the debt to GDP, GDP ratio 2006, 43%. Right here on the graph. 2015, 55.99%. It's going up. Under Harper. Under Harper. Then we see Prime Minister Trudeau, and we see this right here, up until COVID hit. Right. It's gone down a bit. It's and at about 53%. If you looked at, look at that spike right there. See, that's Trudeau. No, that was COVID. That was... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we got 53% here, because, and then it spikes. So prior, as, yes, the Prime Minister was running deficits, Mm -hmm. By choice, those first few years, he originally said that they would be $10 billion each. They were more. Yes. Yep. But they said that this was destroying. Well, we see 53 versus 55, which means he was repairing some mm -hmm. of the damage, slowly but surely. Then COVID hit, which brought us to 74.55%. But unlike Harper Polyev, who after their crash, Debt to GDP ratios kept on rising even seven years later. The very next year, mm -hmm. debt to GDP ratio dropped. And then the following year, it dropped some more. The worst the debt to GDP ratio got during COVID when the federal government assumed borrowing costs that both provincial governments and individual citizens would have had to incur themselves if they were financing it. Remember, when they show you that graph, the federal government has doubled the national debt. Yeah, well, there's a portion of that debt that would be on the provincial books right now. And there's a huge portion of that debt that would be on each of ours individual mm -hmm. books. Calculate all the $2,000. If you weren't working at all and weren't getting much of a salary, calculate all the $2,000 CERB checks you got from beginning to end. Now, imagine if you took a loan out for all of that money at yes. these interest rates. For each individual who collected CERB, that was debt that you would have had to incur personally that the federal government took on on your behalf so because you it has a longer range to pay it and a more advantageous interest rate. 
But Yev and friends are telling you that you were not worth the federal government doing this for you. That your home, where you live, you remaining in it during the COVID period, should not have been a government priority. Well, we're, we're conservatives. We don't believe in these big governments. That you should have been forced, if you were not able to get a loan, to cover yourself for two, the better part of two to three years to sell your house at whatever price you could get. Yeah. That's their position. They're not saying that out loud. But if you're against this, it necessarily means you had to be for something else. So we went up to 74.5%. But unlike the previous government, who kept worsening the debt to GDP ratios, even seven years after their financial struggle, the current one has already decreased it to 74.5%. And in the last, in the budget that we just saw, just just saw was just presented the federal government has shown us that in their fall economic statement they thought that debt jet to gdp ratio would be about 42.4 percent mm -hmm. it came in a little lower about 42.1 it is going to continue to decrease to about 39.5 percent over the next couple of years but the 42 percent at which it is now is lower than the debt to GDP ratio was when Polyev and Harper started governing. Well, don't let facts get in the way of his, his And lies. again, to show it to you, 43.291. We're at 42.1. In the space so. of three years, this current government has dropped debt to GDP ratio from nearly 75% to lower than what it was in 20, 2006 when Harper and Polyev took control of government. Mm. They are not, the current government is very, very, very well managing the finances of the nation. And Pierre Polyev is lying to you. Of course he is. Through his teeth. Not even close to to having doubled. So we need to we need to call him out on that publicly. Media needs to say something. They they got to when he pulls that lie out of his hat again. And and I bet you he'll only do it in the House of Commons, right? Where he has mm -hmm. parliamentary privilege. Mm -hmm. If he's confronted and outside of the house. Thank you. If he's confronted outside of the house and somebody says, um, do you care to answer this? Because you said this, and we actually have the facts here to prove that that is a lie. Yeah. What you said is a lie. Yep. You did that in the House of Commons so you could get a sound bite for your, your social media pages. Yep. Care to and, answer that? Yeah. And since we like having multiple sources, because the sources, you know, when we looked at housing prices, was that one place where we had a graph. Right. Well, listening to the news, and... They were talking to a man called Perk Paul Kershaw, who's a professor at the University of British Columbia School of Population and Public Health and the founder of the group Generation Squeeze. Quote, the demographic, in all honesty, we need to beg their forgiveness. That demographic, sorry, in all honesty, we need to beg their forgiveness. He's talking about millennials and Generation Z. Mm -hmm. We have allowed the dream that a good home should be in reach for what hard work can earn. We've allowed that dream to really slip away. Under Prime Minister Harper, average home prices went up 60%, according to the Canadian Real Estate Association. Under Prime Minister Trudeau, they've gone up another 54%. So the first source that we had showed that they had gone up 70% under Polyev Harper and 51% under Trudeau. This one has a slightly, Canadian Real Estate Association has a narrower gap, 60% under Harper and up 54% under Trudeau. But it still remains true that the prices of houses have gone up less mm -hmm. under Trudeau than they have under Harper and Polyev, and nowhere near 100%. Funny. Corroborating. Corroborating. Yeah. Now, if you're not going to believe the CMHE and you're not going to believe the Canadian Real Estate Association and you're not going to believe these, the Fred graphic there, then, I mean, don't come and tell me it's about affordability and facts for you. Mm-hmm. It's not. Um, he said, I've, and when he's talking about the unfairness to the other generation, he's talking about like himself. He goes, 
I live in Metro Vancouver and I've gained about a million and a half wealth in the last 20 years while I've been watching TV, cleaning in the kitchen and sleeping. And that's come at the expense of a younger person being able to be just as smart as me, just as hardworking as me, but now they can't live where I can live. And he calls this phenomenon over extraction. And who, who and is says this that the, quoting? Who are we quoting? Par, pardon? Who was the quote who, from? Uh, Paul Kershaw, professor at the University of British Columbia School of Population and Public Health. Thank you. And the founder of the group meeting. Generation Squeeze. Um, and I'm thinking I might write, write to him and try to see if we can get him on the That'd show. That'd be great. We'd have to do a pre-record though, because he's out in BC. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but over extraction, he's talking about the baby boom generation having picked the best fruits of the economy and leaving behind scraps, or even worse, a cleanup bill for Generation Z and millennials. And he says that this has been evident both in environmental and fiscal policy. Now, in environmental policy, we can see the obvious, right? We've used all the water. We've cut down all the trees. Mm -hmm. This, And now we're doing stuff. And the, 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 you know, the chickens are coming home to roost. And there's still some people that still, even though they got all the benefits of living in this great world, still yeah. don't want to do anything to make sure that they pass it on. They say, no, no, I want to make sure that I keep on leaving cushy. And on fiscal policy, it's been the same thing because the baby boom generation was the largest generation, right, population-wise. So they had the ear of the government saying, well, we want these programs. Well, they had all these programs when they were younger, and they've also prepared the, per the terrain to make sure that they wouldn't be doing without when they were older. So uh, Mr. Kershaw points out when he talks about over-extraction, for example, old age security. He talks how this will be a rapidly growing budget line item. Quote, by 2028, for every new federal dollar being spent on the environment, housing, defense, child care, and health care combined for people under 45, nearly three new dollars will be spent on old age security, health care for over 65s, and debt servicing. The boomers took everything. Yeah. They really did. And you know, I had a... a a few weeks back, um, well, I can't remember what it was, the day of Ed Broadbent's funeral, uh, we met uh, two uh, ladies at the pump where we went in for a roast beef dinner. And uh, one of the ladies was in her 70s, and I think she was 77. I thought she was much younger than that, but 77. And we had a chat about this, and she said, oh, we owe you people so much. We took everything. We took everything. We squandered your future. I mean, there's a reason... For First there's time I've heard a boomer say that. There's a reason student grants disappeared just as I was starting university. Mm -hmm. The boomers got all the student grants and the low student loan rates. By the time I got there, there were no more grants. No, it was all And no. student loans had been given over to the banks. So we were charged higher interest rates. And, and that was the thing when they ended that program and handed it to the banks. And it was Mike Harris who did that in Ontario. I was the first generation that graduated with $27,000 student loans. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know people who went to med school that had less in student loans, right? Because there was grants that were, came forward by the federal government. There were uh, scholarships galore at the time. And the student loans that you did have were spaced out over like a, a mortgage damn near, like 20 years, 20 or 25 years. They, the interest rate was extremely low. So they, they took advantage of all those systems and then screwed our generation because we're Gen X and we're the first generation to get screwed by that. Yep. But they never talk about Gen X. Have you noticed that? Yep. It's always the millennials and Gen Z. We're apparently the forgotten we're the, generation. Apparently we're also the quiet one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's because we're sitting in the back going, yeah, we don't give a shit. <laughs> right. Yep. Well, what was it? The, the thing that the picture of Karen from Will and Grace, Gen X, Karen, Gen Z, and there's a child and she's pouring whiskey in his glass. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Gen X, Gen Z. Don't worry. We got your back, Gen Z. We're right there with you. Yep, absolutely. And I just have sympathy for the millennials because so many of them are completely screwed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are a Canadian who happens to be a big fan of chess at the moment, Chess. Uh, oh, well, sorry, chess. <laughs> I think a lot of Canadians are fans of chess. <laughs> Doesn't I matter your particular stripe of of uh, sexuality. Everybody loves boobs. <laughs> or chest. <laughs> or chest. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll get cheeky. There we go. Here hey, we go. hey, hey, hey. There we go. We live in a country that had Mr. Dress Up and a Trickle Trunk. Tickle, Tickle Trunk. trunk Are we surprised that we love chest? But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, so um, if you do like chess, the world's most prestigious chess tournament is currently going on in Toronto at the moment. It'll take several weeks. It's called the Candidates Tournament. And the reason why it's the most prestigious chess tournament in the world is that the winner gets to play in the World Championship match. So right now, as we uh, as we're doing this, the best grandmasters, Chen, I said tennis, I was going to say tennis grandmasters, chess grandmasters from all around the world are in Canada, including one of them being a 17-year-old phenom. So it's being held for the first time ever in North America, actually. And it's being held in Toronto. The winner of the last two tournaments is also there, vying for his third win. And uh, so if you happened to uh, like chess, uh, look it up uh, online, the Candidates Tournament. You might, uh, I'm guessing that you might even be able to go and watch some live chess. There, there's been stories of uh, people that have traveled like from all over the country to come in and uh, watch it being played. So, um, and I didn't even know what was happening. Apparently, it's been going on already for like at least for a week, and hadn't heard of it until I, I until I just happened to stumble across. And like, not, not in a, you know, like when you're watching the news or like the story that they say for the end, you know, that the happy little feel good story, or something like was covered in in that way, and not as like, hey the biggest chess tournament of the world is actually happening right here. Like that in itself is like news. But it was like, oh yeah, and by the way, <laughs> as we're ending, if you happen to like chess, you know, sport with no history, no culture, and like nobody looks at it as like being like something like, oh my God, chess people. Like who doesn't have respect for chess people? people chess players I mean, all the mm -hmm. strategy, all the possible combination of moves, everything you got I mean. You know, it takes a very special kind of person with a very kind of special, you know, mind to be able to play this game and play it well to, to achieve that level. So I can understand that chess fans are uh, are very, very, very um, enthusiastic fans of the, their game or sport, depending on how you want to call, call it. But in other news, chess news also, there's a Nigerian chess master who just broke the world record for the world's longest chess marathon. He was playing in New York. And uh, his name is Tunde Onokoya. He played chess nonstop for 60 consecutive hours in an attempt to break the Guinness World Record. He's 29 years old, and he did it to raise $1 million for children's education across Africa. Uh, that I know the record has not yet been certified, but um, there you go. I do not know if uh, Mr. Onokoya is, uh, or Miss, I guess, I'm assuming, but Tunde, mm. I, I don't know if Tunde is a ma male or female name, to be totally oh, yeah. honest. I can't tell. I uh, don't know if they are in Toronto or if this was uh, overlapping, because this was news from a couple of days ago. But, um, yeah. You get everything here at the Beaver Lodge. We'll even talk chess. We don't care. If it's good and if it's happening, we'll talk about it. Well, we are general culture, Right. Right. Indeed. That's why we cover sports and music, amongst other things. Yep. So, uh, another thing that's uh, interesting that's happened, uh, this might be more familiar to people who speak and understand French, but about 40 years ago, uh, there was a song. And this song, particular for me, uh, particularly stands out because um, as a Franco-Ontarian kid, even mm -hmm. though you're speaking French, uh, Listening to French music and watching French shows and stuff like that wasn't cool, right? Uh, well, so I didn't really know much. You, my friend, la la yeah. la, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> other than other than little Remy René Simard back in the day, who was a, a child star, mm -hmm. my mom had an album of his. I had never listened to songs in French other than the songs that they taught us in school. Right. right. And at some point, like around like twelve or thirteen or something like that, I started listening to like. French radio and French songs. It's like, oh my God, you know, French songs. Because my vision of French songs was all Edith Piaf and Jacques Brel, and, you know, the, mm. the chansonniers. And, you know, and it's like, well, that music sounds old, especially, you know, when you were a disco baby. I was raised on Ring My Bell and Boogie Woogie Woogie Dancing Shoes. Right? Not, Quand il me prend dans ses bras. Right? And you remember this song? <laughs> uh, totally different music. 
I can see the disco queen. I can't remember her name. I'm a star in New York. I'm a star in L.A. From L.A. to you. No, you don't remember that? No, I don't know. Patsy that. Gallant, I think it was. Oh, Patsy Gallant, yes, from Canada, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Patsy Gallant, big disco queen. Um, so about 40 years ago, one of the very first French songs that I heard and that I liked was a song called Quand on est en amour by a singer named Patrick Doma, who's a country singer in Quebec. Had a long career, 55-year career. Wow. A uh, song literally translates as when we are in love or when you are in love. It's a very, very simple song. Right? Ne laisse pas passer la chance d'être aimé. Le cœur devient moins lourd quand on est en amour. That's the chorus. Very simple. Basically, don't let the chance to be loved pass. You know, uh, the heart becomes lighter when you are in love. That's essentially the chorus. Well, it seems that at the height of the Rwandan, Rwandan genocide, um, that song was a big hit in Rwanda at the time. Uh, this year is the 30-year anniversary or commemoration. It's not, I, don't, I always find it weird what the word is when it's like 30 years of a bad thing that you're remembering because it's not... I hate to say anniversary. It's not like we're celebrating. Um, that song became really popular. And one day, apparently, some there was a lady from Rwanda who had come up to Patrick Doma in Quebec and told him about the song, that the song had changed her life. She was like thinking of ending it all. And, you know, it, it gave her strength to keep going. And apparently that song did that for a lot of people. So a while ago, Patrick Doma finally decided to go to Rwanda to see for himself what it was all about because he had you know he had been accosted like this a few times and a documentary director went with them and they made a documentary called uh, Patrick Norman au Rwanda un devoir de mémoire or Patrick Norman in Rwanda um, un devoir de mémoire a duty to memory basically and they filmed them there and uh, the documentary is actually being shown at the Nuit d'Afrique festival in uh, Montreal right now which is a great festival by the way if you ever have a chance to be in Montreal for Nuit d'Afrique Absolutely, do go. It's fantastic. Music, dance, all African influenced. It's just a great time. Um, so yeah, he went to see for himself what it what it what it is. And uh, so, uh, if you would be interested in hearing about that, because you know, every now and then, you want a palate cleanser from the news. Uh, there's an interview uh, on CBC Radio, and I put the, the link in for uh, Mr. Grizzly here. Um, so you can share it with you, but it's just the concept of, you know, you never know what you're going to, you never know where, what you do as an artist is going to eventually going to end up. It's very true. So little song popular only in Quebec. I don't think the song crossed, you know, the, the ocean to, to, to the French nations in Europe, but somehow made it, made its way to Rwanda and 10 years after it was released in Canada became a song, just the right song at the right time while everybody's being cruel to everyone. The song that just says, you know, the heart is lighter when we are in love. Don't let pass the chance to be loved. Was a rallying cry. And apparently in the movie, there are scenes of him like in a record store and they're actually showing him copies of his record. And, you know, he starts singing a line and everybody in the store is like singing it with him. You never know. Never know where what you do ends up, and you never know how what you do will influence people you never even thought that you would ever ever meet, or ever thought that would ever even come across your work. Just it's, it's nice true. to know. It's nice to know. It's nice to know that what you what you do can have a much greater impact. I'm sure there was no way he was sitting there writing that song thinking, oh, of course not. one day this song is going to be a song that people of an entire nation are going to rally around when they need hope. An entire nation I've probably never heard of, right? <laughs> right? So, um, again, Canadians that make us proud. Canadian that made us proud 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. There you go. I like that song. I have a, I really I have did. Something. I, have something. I still do. I shouldn't talk about it in the past tense. I have something <laughs> to show you from uh, 
Our friend uh, Dan sent this photo. That's his, this is a picture of his mom with uh, then police uh, TPS uh, chief uh, Bill. Yeah, yes. Yeah, his mom was uh, worked, uh, served in TPS for thirty two years. So hey, cool. Well done. Good on you. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah. Wow. wow. There you go. Uh, I'm seeing some comments here in the chat about someone being a cutie, but I'm not sure if that was about Patrick Norman back in the day or somebody else, and I, I, and I missed uh, I don't know. <laughs> the beginning of the, the conversation. Um, another thing you might want to know, if you happen to be Muslim and listening to the show, the federal government is looking at a way to expand halal mortgages, which are designed specifically for the Muslim community in accordance with their faith, because uh, if you didn't know that, uh, if you're Muslim, uh, your religion uh, does not allow you uh, to pay usury fees. Correct. Or so interest. interest. Interest-free loans, yes. basically, is what it boils down Yeah. To. So these are not mortgages where people get things for free. They just have no. different types of service fees and stuff with them so that people are not paying interest. They're just structured in another way. And apparently, uh, 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 what's his name in uh, Quebec? Uh, lost his mind over it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, however, uh, most banks do not offer them. No. So, uh, and... These halal mortgages, having mortgages that are structured this way are, are still somewhat important because it makes, not for people, for Muslim Canadians, it makes navigating bureaucracies such as land titles and uh, tax credits more difficult uh, if you don't have that. So the government says that it will update on halal mortgages in the fall economic statement and uh, hopefully... Uh, people that are currently in the halal mortgage business, mortgage business are actually very happy and enthusiastic about this because um, hopefully that will uh, allow them to be able to deal with banks a whole lot uh, more easier. Uh, they'll be able to go up to banks and say, see, these are actually legitimate products now. The federal mm -hmm. government is you know, trying to encourage them. So now you have no reason uh, you know, to make it difficult, which uh, might... Uh, end up being a boon to the community and who knows might even might even result in more favorable uh interest rates. not fav not favorable interest rates because they won't be paying interest rates but more favorable service charges given that there's a um wider access and uh right. for financing for these types of loans from the people who will be offering them if not the major banks or even maybe some major banks might actually start offering them now as time well. will tell yeah so just a very uh, little important note there. Uh, also, when we're talking about uh, smaller groups in Canada, um, Canadian MPs and senators want to establish an Acadian parliamentary group specifically yeah. uh, to, so that they can advance with a single voice the priorities of Acadia in the House of Commons. It seems that it's an all-party group. Even conservatives are taking part of it. And uh, the need for it stems from some recent brouhaha surrounding the broadcasting of the uh, August 5th, 15th Acadia Day concert. Um, it seems that uh, either for last year or for this coming year, it has been decided that it will not be broadcast for some reason. Mm. And uh, a lot of people had turned around and said, hey, 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 wait a minute here. Yeah. So um, apparently they've gotten together. It seems that three meetings have already taken place according to Liberal MP uh, from Sackville, Daryl Sampson, and uh, that they will uh, be continuing uh, to do that. Um, also, the other day, and I'm hoping I can find that because this was in a note from a while ago, but uh, the Ab uh, Acadian community in Canada actually had got scored uh, an important legal victory because uh, the government in New Brunswick, who we know is not particularly um, friendly to the Francophone community, Premier Blaine Higgs, uh, used to be associated with a political party in the province called CORE, the Confederation of Regions, and they had a very um, not pro-bilingualism position. And it is the only uh, bilingual province in the country, exactly. by the way, officially. Yes. So the Francophone community of the Acadian Peninsula won an important legal battle when the Court of the King's Bench reversed a decision by the Higgs government to close down the courthouses of Tracadie and Caraquette because, and because the government did not respect its obligations towards the linguistic minority community. That was the reason for which uh, that decision was overturned by the courts. Uh, all the court 
all the court cases in that region of the Akkadian Peninsula are being heard in Bathurst, which is about an hour away from either of the locations of Tracadie and Karaket. The mayor of Tracadie, Denis Lozier, said, Pour nous, je pense les francophones, c'est une décision historique. Uh, so, so, for us, the francophones, I think that's a historic decision. Um, the government has not announced yet the return of services, or at least at the time I took these notes. Uh, the Minister of Justice of the province says that they will study the decision and decide on whether to pursue an appeal or not. The president of the mayor's forum, who is all happens to be the mayor of Cadaquet, Bernard Thériault, said, Il faut s'attendre à tout, mais nous, ce qu'on lui dit, tout ça peut se régler d'une façon très simple, ramener les services de justice dans la péninsule acadienne. Basically, he says, you know, you have to, uh, oh, we can, basically, we have to expect anything from this government. But, uh, us, what we are telling him is, all of this can be solved in a really simple fashion. Just bring back the court services to the Acadian Peninsula. How difficult is that? Yes. Now, jurists say that the government will have to do more than just say they've considered the impact of their decisions and the community that it was acceptable henceforth, such as justifying the basis of the decisions they take, and they have to say if it could have an impact on the Francophone community. So. What the federal, what the provincial government did said when they closed it, they said they testified to court. So, yeah, yeah, we considered what the impact would be on the francophone community, but we did it anyway. It seems that now with this ruling, if the if the provincial government is going to do that again, they will actually have to show the work that they've actually considered. So they won't be able to get by by saying, "Oh, yeah, yeah, we considered it," when they really didn't. They're actually going to have to do the work and show the work. Mm. Uh, so again really, really important because access to the judicial system has to be fair and equitable. And in this case, uh, people were denied equal access or timely access simply because they were francophones. You can't do that. No. Especially when it comes to access to justice. I mean, that's the, the justice and medical services. Those are the two, and education. Those are the three parts that you get. Everybody needs equal access to education, equal access to healthcare, equal access to justice. And to at deny a anybody of that is just criminal. No. Everybody needs equal access to everything, but at a minimum, mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. health, and the, and the just the judicial system. Indeed, fundamental obligations of the provincial government that were not being taken care of. The courts decided. Hey, you need to shape up. Oh, yeah. So there we go. Mr. Grizzly, do you have anything? I have uh, the Melissa Lanceman Vashi, Vashi Capello's clip here. Oh, please. Yes. It's two minutes and four seconds of <sighs> hold your <sighs> nose, hold your breath. Just, just, just watch this garbage. This, this. <sighs> here we go. Exasperated all the damn time. I'll start with you. Uh, would a conservative government reverse the capital gains tax changes that the Liberals have brought in with this budget? Well, let's get back to, to how we started. We have the Prime Minister who said eight years ago, nine budgets ago, that the rich would pay their fair share. And we know what has happened is that that's not the case. It isn't uh, Justin Trudeau and people like him who have a trust fund who can shelter away those taxes. It isn't the billionaires that he vacations with on islands that move their money to other jurisdictions that have paid this. It's everyday Canadians, welders, plumbers, single mothers, seniors that have paid for all of the spending and all of the taxes that Justin Trudeau has imposed on Canadians. So I don't understand if it, that's not really an answer to the question about whether the sort of government would change that policy in particular, which does apply actually to corporate trusts. Actually, we're, we're going to continue to focus on axing the tax and building the homes and fixing the budget and stopping the crime. That's what we're talking to about with Canadians. And I'm sure that when we have a platform, you will be the first to know, and we might even announce it on your show. Uh, well, I look forward <laughs> to that very much. Uh, but I think like in this instance, I'm just asking for your policy position on something very specific that, and, and I'll be totally transparent, the Liberals are using to try and wedge against you, right? They're trying to say that your party, as a consequence of not coming out in support of this measure, 
is not prepared to make wealthy people in this country pay their fair share. You can dispel that very easily by saying we would keep it or we would reverse it, we're, we're but you're not. We're going to fight a prime minister who hasn't made anybody pay, or hasn't made, had the rich guy pay for, uh, for his promises. He's had everyday Canadians pay for every single one of his inflationary budgets that he's brought forward. And when we do have uh, a, a platform, you will be the first to so know. So it's fair to say you don't have a position on that tax change at well, this point? Well, we're going to continue to fight the fight that we've been fighting for everyday Canadians who are paying what? far too much, uh, paying more for gas, for groceries, for home heating. They can't afford to live, and that's why we are going to vote against this budget. What a crock of shit. <laughs> yep. And here she is, right, sitting there going like this. This prime minister hasn't done anything in nine years to make the rich pay their fair share. And we haven't heard a word about you from it until now because that suited you just fine. Exactly. Right, Melissa? Because, And if you're sitting there, and we're talking about consistency and inconsistency, you're sitting there talking, and you have the national audience there. That goes, there has been, this prime minister has not taxed the rich in nine years. So will you do it? I oh, will. You can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what it is, right? I'm like, oh my God. If you're going to come out with that position... The obvious follow-up line is, yes, we are going to do something about it. That's why I'm here they to agree. tell you what we're going to do. They're <laughs> not mine too. It's like, it's terrible. The government has taxed the rich. They said that they were. Oh, my God, it's terrible. So, so you're taxing, taxing the rich. Well, so you're taxing the rich. <laughs> we can't, we can't let our wealthy donor class be, be punished by, you know, paying their fair share. When we have a platform. When we have a platform. Yeah. When we have a platform. Axe the tax, build the homes, stop the crime. You have no plan to do any of that. Those are slogans, nothing more. Look, your social media game is good. Your comms game is good. You do not have a platform. And unfortunately, the loudest voices in the room across the country are the ill-informed individuals who believe you're bullshit. Because it's bullshit. You have nothing. And unfortunately, people are buying into the nothing that they have. Now, that being said, I believe the vast majority of Canadians, the silent majority, are too busy going about their lives every damn day. I don't, I don't think most people believe the shit she's trying to sell us. I, I sincerely do not believe it. You have loud voices, you know, squeaky wheels. That's about it. The vast majority of Canadians are very much centrist, maybe center left, maybe center right, but the vast majority are centrist, period. Yep. And, and the, the, these ridiculous slogans that have, they're completely empty and meaningless, but they're catchy and they catch on on social media. They'll keep spewing them out as long as they can. They might be able to get a few people to actually vote for them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it, you know what? That reminds me a little bit. Remember when we, the days when we had Blockbuster and you'd go and you'd look for videos and you'd see all these movies you saw in the movie theater. And then there was this whole section of movies like you had never heard of before. Right. Because they were straight to video. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I just noticed like, and just like Skippy's slogans, all the straight to video titles were always three words like hard to kill. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, excellent. it's like maybe three syllable three or four syllable, three word things, titles okay. and slogans and whatnot, are probably not the best way to go. They're just going for the lowest common denominator is all yeah. it is. Now, speaking of uh, people who spew crap, oh, Danielle is... Smith, Yeah, uh, I would like you to play this clip because Danielle Smith, uh, she uh, posted this with, just like Quebec, Alberta is asserting its constitutional authority. No longer will the federal government get to pit cities against one another in our province with unreasonable conditions. So, um, she wants to be just like Quebec. So let's see what she has to say. And then let's debunk 
again with another what fact What we check. discovered in Alberta is the federal government wasn't talking to us. They were doing a workaround, going directly to municipalities, being unfair about it, pitting one community against another, putting unreasonable conditions on it. So I think it's my job to make sure that dollars flow back to Alberta in equal proportion to the rest of the country and to make sure that our communities are treated fairly. And that's what we're going to do. I talked to a number of municipalities who didn't even bother applying because of the onerous paperwork they would have to go through to try to get their particular particular project approved at the federal level. And, and it's, it's just simply impossible for the federal government to ink bilateral deals with, with 350 municipalities. We already have those relationships because we deal with them every day. We've got funding partnerships with them that are elaborate. And so the federal government would be better off partnering with us and leveraging the relationships and the processes we already have. Many of the measures announced in this week's federal budget will need some kind of buy-in, negotiation, bilateral agreement with provincial governments, like that infrastructure for housing announcement, for example. What is your reaction to many of these spending measures that were in Mr. Trudeau's latest budget, Premier? We had a community infrastructure grant that had been a program in place for 10 years, building on the gas tax that was collected at the municipal level. And I don't really see much evidence that that exists in this new budget, which is a real shame because many communities, in order to be able to achieve affordable housing, need to be able to build infrastructure. They need to be able to build roads and bridges and water and wastewater. And so I, I think that they've they've done a, a bit of a swing and a miss here in trying to achieve the outcome. They are, are, I think, micromanaging in areas of provincial jurisdiction and missing the bigger picture of how they could be a true partner on infrastructure spending. At the same time, they're spending a lot overspending, overtaxing, overborrowing, overinterfering in our jurisdiction. And I, I don't know that they're going to get the results that they would like to achieve, but it's it's certainly the opposite of intergenerational fairness. Intergenerational fairness does not blow the budget and amass massive debts today that future generations are going to have to pay for. So I, I think that there's a, a lot of disappointment that they didn't get a better balance. Oh, that's 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 cute. Yeah. Okay, one. The federal government didn't talk to us. They went behind our backs. No, no. The federal government's talked to you. You made it very clear that you were not going to participate or be helpful in any way, shape, or form. Which doesn't then work. the federal government started talking to municipalities without talking to you. But you had first option. First lie. Number two. It says, there's 350 municipalities in Alberta. The federal government can't go out and make deals with 350 municipalities. That's impossible. Well, uh, as of March 4th, 2024, according to the CMHC, again, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the Housing Accelerator Fund received, program received 544 applications, of which 179 resulted in signed agreements. Local announcements can be expected in the new future. Launched in March 2023, the Housing Accelerator Fund is a $4 billion initiative from the Government of Canada that will run until 2026-2027. Um, if it's impossible for the federal government to sign three, to make 350 agreements, uh, how is it mm, signed 179 already <laughs> in just the short time is that the really impossible? Yeah. It received 544 applications. It funded 179. So clearly there's some interest there. You think? So uh, what Danielle's saying there can't be true whatsoever. And then she talked about, well, the federal government not being willing to do anything on infrastructure, but wasn't one of the pre-budget announcement tour things about $6 billion for infrastructure fund so that cities can build the sewer systems and electrical connections and whatnot to create new neighborhoods for housing. Like this like was just announced like within the last two and a half weeks, like just, just announced. I don't know what the deal is with this person. I don't know. But she's like broadcasting from an entirely different reality than the rest of us are living in. <sighs> Alberta, man. My fellow Albertans, <laughs> fellow Canadians living in Alberta. I should say, I can't say fellow Albertans because I'm not Albertan. Uh, but, I used to oh my there. word. Both my sisters were born there. One in Cold Lake, one in Calgary. There's Alberta in the blood. 
I'm sending you all the love and actual real Tylenol for your headaches. Yeah. Because, I'll tell you what, she is good at gaslighting. Mm. She's good. She does that thing with that whole reasonable sounding calm voice and just uh, but as we as we keep on saying as Nate, Nate Pike told us once you first accept that Daniel Smith will always first choose to lie then you can begin to understand her Ugh. Mr. Grizzly do we have a show we do indeed all right, kids and cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we loved making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless, so please tell your peeps and poops all about us. And uh, Kit Jen, uh, I saw that you were in uh, the process of a big move, and I hope that all of that is going very, 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 very smoothly for you and that you will enjoy and be very, very happy in your new home. If you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, you do not have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl, who has sponsored our pod page. If you scan that QR code, that's right under my, under my chin. It'll take you right there. And if you're listening, you go to podpage.com slash the true North Eager Beaver lowercase letters. And when you subscribe to us there, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, you will not miss an episode. Kit Linda M says, by elections on May 2nd in Milton and Lambton, if you live there, make sure you vote. Thank you. So little democracy is something that you do point a little early there. If you would like to support us in other ways, please go to the True North Eager Beaver YouTube page, Make Like Kit Elaine, and click our buttons, like, share, subscribe. We have crossed the 750, so fewer than 250 to go before we reach the magic thousand. That is the next objective. Thank you so much, Kits and Cubs, for helping us uh, hit the 750 threshold. It means a lot to us. Um, please keep on sharing the good word. Please keep on subscribing. It uh, really, really, really helps us out big time. It and does. if you would, it does. And thank you for uh, tuning in to uh, the podcast. Those of us, uh, those of you who joined us last Saturday, it was a very fun time and we loved having you there. If you would like to support us in yet other ways, uh, the QR code that is by Mr. Chrisley's head brings you to our coffee page, the emergency hydration fund here at the Beaver Lodge. So uh, if you would like to help us and encourage us to produce uh, the show and uh, deliver it and create it, uh, because you love and enjoy it. Thank you very much. And if you hate watch us, but you want us to remain on the air because, well, you can't get through your day without your fix of rage, donate. Yeah. Keep us running. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, we're, 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 we're not picky. No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Your money, your money is good here. It is. <laughs> Just to let you know. Uh, because democracy is something that you do, as uh, Kitlin uh, M. has mentioned, by elections on May 2nd in Milton and Lambton. If you live there, make sure you vote. Today is the last day to make sure you get your request in for uh, a membership to be able to vote in the Alberta NDP leadership race. So uh, if you haven't made your request yet, please do it. Um, this is where the real action is at. So uh, that's where your vote uh, has the most weight. So please do do that. Uh, register if you can. Uh, let's see, what else do you we have? do do. Yes. <laughs> do do that voodoo that you do so well. Yeah. For you do something to me. Anyway. <laughs> Little Marlena Dietrich, or if you like the more modern version, Sinead O'Connor actually did a cover of that. Mm. Uh, I have some breaking news, sir. Ooh, breaking news. Okay. Breaking news. Alberta emergency alert. Uh, province of Alberta has issued an emergency alert, active alert description. Uh, the re regional municipality of Wood Buffalo is issuing, issuing a wildfire alert. An evacuation alert has been issued for Spray Creek states due to the potential of a nearby wildfire spreading towards the community. If you're in this area, be prepared to leave on short notice. For up-to-date information, go to mrwb.ca or sorry, rmwb.ca backslash evacuate or forward slash evacuate. My apologies. I get the slashes mixed up. So yeah, wildfire yep. season. That was issued yesterday at 3.50 p.m. 
by the way, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, um, the fir- uh, that's the first potential evacuation alert of the season that I'm aware of. Yeah, and they're uh, north of Fort McMurray. I don't know how far north, but it's north of Fort Mac. Yeah, Fort Kitchen. Mac, of course. I remember what happened in them a few years. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, from the Beaver Lodge. <laughs> Tickets, Tim Trudeau and his space lasers. Oh, 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 oh. It was it was for the day he was on the roof looking at the uh, looking at the eclipse when he put the glasses on. He got all the energy of the sun into his eyes, and now he just looked Alberta's way and psh, psh, space lasered it. Give me yeah, that that's going to be the story. That's definitely going to be the story. Oh, hello, Hi, Mademoiselle how Fox. How are you? I'm okay. Um, You're looking you chic. Know? Thank you. It's, I'm, I'm actually just covering up my pajamas with a scarf, but thanks. Oh, those are chic pajamas. It looks like <laughs> a, a dress that has like blue on one side and just white on the other. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Thank you so much. I just, I'm going to try not to get too emotional, but uh, someone who's near and dear to me just started uh, firefighting in Alberta. Oh. Um, a young person who I'm very close with and uh, he got put on the helicopter crew so I just am hearing this news and I'm just ah where is it where is it near Peace River is he gonna get pulled in and he's still in training so probably not but uh makes it real doesn't it it does (laughs) yeah Yeah, it really does anyway but they're very very well trained and very safe and very professional but it's still terrifying to to know Bridget needs a robe (laughs) she has one you have one do and it should be fuzzy pink, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now you're looking like high fashion just rolled out of bed. Oh, good morning. It's just Monday. I don't, just something I threw on. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for letting me jump in. Have a great rest of the show. Hey, thank you too. It's always a joy to see you. Thank you, you too. Aww. All right. So on that note, from the Beaver Lodge, this is your Iggy Beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself and do something nice for Mother Earth today. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom, please. Yeah, you've seen that it is Earth Day. Uh, maybe take some time to yourself if you can and get outside and enjoy the planet because we don't know how much longer we have one for with the way things are going. And I don't mean that to be negative, uh, warlike or anything like that. It's just, you know. The next uh, things, 28 years are baked in, okay, folks. Yeah, things could be better. Things could be better. So try and get out and enjoy the weather if you can, if it's nice and sunny where you are. It's going to be a little, it's going to be chilly here today. I think the high is only eight degrees. But that being said, uh, I'm looking at the forecast over the next seven days in Canada's capital. And uh, tomorrow it'll be 16 and raining, uh, overnight low of zero. Wednesday it'll be a high of four, <laughs> a low of minus eight. Thursday 10, mm. Friday 17, Saturday 16, Sunday 20. So the warm weather's on its way, but it's just, it's, it's the, it's the roller coaster right now. It's, you know, moderate levels to cold. Minus eight in April is cold. Yep. Like really cold. Yeah. Maximum is going to hit at the Beaver Lodge here today is seven. Yeah. It's, it's not spring-like weather. The last really? few years of, well, actually last April was uh, an anomaly, right? Because it was 28 yes. degrees in yes. mid-April. And it stayed that way for about a week. Uh, but the last few years I've noticed, the last 10 or 12 years, um, we've had like an early early spring like weather full arrive spring. in February and March, full spring. And then we get a snowstorm, usually in March or in this case, April. And then, then the weather gets like it is right now. April is normally warmer than this, though. So it's, it's, it's probably a little warmer. Yeah. But I think this has to do with El Nino this year, which is why the winter was so mild. Yes. I could be wrong. La, I'm not a meteorologist. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Mr. Grizzly, please roll the credits and cue the cock. I just got to find her. Oh, there, there, there he is. There he is. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind.
We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, before we go, there's uh, something that I wanted to uh, put up because I was asked to do this during the pub chat and I actually forgot to do it. I did promote it on our uh, on the Twitter feed, but um, uh, I forgot to mention it. It was uh, Miss Shadika that asked for this. Uh, okay. it's, uh, it's for her, her friend's daughter that she, she is asking, but uh, Toronto Police Operations put out uh, this uh, missing person's uh, alert for uh, someone. I'm going to guess the name is Iriel mm -hmm. or Iriel 15 last seen April 19th in the Warden Avenue and Danforth Avenue area uh, described as five foot eight, 130 pounds with a thin build, shorter length, curly black hair, uh, wearing a light blue jeans, a white shirt and a red zip up sweater with a hood number G O eight, four Oh six, nine, one. Here's an image. Um, please, uh, take a long look. And, uh, if you are able to help, please do. And Ms. Shadika here says in the chat, uh, thank you. She is still missing. Um, so please, I'm just going to leave it up there for a couple of seconds so that you have uh, time, uh, to get a good look. Uh, but if you do have any information, if you are able to help, please, please, please do. Um, Mm. something about missing kids just um get you pretty hard eh? yeah 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 and uh in a totally unrelated uh note uh if you are uh interested in the green belt scandal mm. and really want to know about it uh the folks at the narwhal have been producing incredible incredible wonderful uh, very informative in-depth investigative copy about this and uh for people who don't like to read but prefer podcasts uh, there's a podcast called the big story hosted by jonathan heath rollins i believe it's a it's a podcast that i i really enjoy mm -hmm. uh and they will have emma mcintosh from the narwhal who is one of uh, uh one of the writers who have done a lot of research in there and i think that they have a three-part series starting uh, that will come up uh, i think one part each monday the first one starting today uh, called uh, Pay Dirt, the inside story of the Green Belt scandal. Uh, so you can uh, get to uh, catch up or get the full picture based on the good work that they have done. Uh, so I wanted to bring attention to it because uh, we like to promote uh, people who are doing good work. And uh, the people at the Narwhal did very, very, very good work. And I'm uh, very happy uh, that, uh, like I said, the inside story, which is a podcast that I do recommend. Uh, if you uh, like a some, uh, you know, 20 to 30 minutes in depth, uh, takes on the more in depth takes on the subjects. Uh, it's, it's worth your listen. Uh, but this one in particular is one that I'm going to be listening to, uh, with great attention, uh, because I'm sure there are some bits that I've missed along the way because the news came out really fast and furious at some point mm -hmm. and there were lots of players. Uh, so this will bring it all together. All right, Mr. Grizzly, uh, Unless you have uh, words of wisdom, or no, no, you mentioned them already. Unless you have anything else, because this one went a little longer. I have a clip. I okay. do have a clip. This is uh, 45 seconds of David Cochran and Plain Higgs. Oh, yes. Just, just watch this. By 3.3 cents a liter on April 1, and, and everybody wanted a meeting about that. Why were the premiums so silent when the oil companies raised the price of fuel this week by like 12 cents a liter in a lot of places? because they were moving over to summer gas. I mean, this is something corporations are doing. That's four years of carbon tax overnight, and it's all driven by the industry. Well, it's driven by the summer regulations and the, and the, the vapor pressure requirements and restrictions on summer fuel. So that is not a new thing. It happens every spring and it changes every fall. Um, so it costs more to, to refine product for summer regulations. Um, that's where it comes from. So it's not, you know, along with the market volatility that we've seen, you know, over the years, that is a seasonal um, thing that happens and it's not a, not a new thing. By 3.3 .3 cents a liter on April 1 and, and everybody wanted a meeting about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yep. Not a new thing. Happens every year. And it but doesn't happen at the same that. time across the country. No, but they're silent about it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, that, that, that thing, no. No. Fourteen cents, well, that's friends. normal. But the three cents, that's going to bankrupt us all. Yep. Uh, I'm loving this area. Uh, you know what? Hey, if the conservatives are dumb enough to be defending billionaires and billionaires during mm -hmm. an affordability crisis, and if uh, progressive parties are... Uh, doing the things that they need to do to position the pieces on the chessboard such that uh, the conservatives are either defending them or can't say whether or not they're going to defend them. Um, that's a good day for us. All right. Have a great week, kids. I'll, uh, I'll see you.